I changed the title of my talk a little bit to make it more attractive. So it's now <laughs> Morphological Analysis and Named Entity Recognition for you, your Lucene and Solar Search Applications. So this is the outline of my talk. I will um, say a few words about IntroFind first and myself. Then I um, give you some well, information about indexing, probably most of that uh, you know you already know. And then I'm going to talk about morphological ana analysis. What is it? How can it improve your search? How is it implemented? And um, the same then about named entity recognition. Again, what is it? How can it improve your search? How is, is it implemented? So about myself, um, I got a PhD in computer science. Um, I'm a Lucene committer, and um, well, I got a background in machine learning and computer linguistics mainly. So um, about IntroFind, we are in the, well, our main business is enterprise search. So we have our own enterprise search product, which is called eFinder. It's basically, it's based on Lucene. It's implemented in Java. It wraps Lucene, so we have a um, somehow simpler API for our partners, uh, mostly. And it offers a graphical user interface, a user and administration interface. So um, we, we are in this business for eight years now, and um, we have mainly customers in German-speaking countries. And we have a, well, about 700 installations. That's only a small fraction are direct customers of, our, of IntroFind. And most of these installations is via our partner network. And, well, um, let me say that one important aspect um, about um, doing business with open source search to, uh, to our experience is you have to be flexible. So most of our components have been um, well, ported to .NET because we have customers who really don't want or cannot um, use Java versions and even who cannot use um, web services based on Tomcat and Java. So we ported our stuff to .NET. We also offer services and support for plain Lucene and Solar um, projects for customers who have experience in this field. And well, the, the aspects I want to talk uh, especially today is um, we have um, well, a couple of additional modules um, based on Lucene, mostly text analytics modules. So it's um, linguistic analyzers, it's named entity recognition, both are covered today, but we also have text classification and clustering. So a um, few words about inverted index, probably most of you know this already. Um, the inverted index sto stores um, an alphabetical sorted list of all terms of your documents and it stores for these, these terms postings and positions. So if we look on the left side, we have three documents, very short documents. It is what it is, what is it, and it is a banana. And the inverted index, it just sorts all words alphabetically. And um, for these words, we have the, the postings and positions. So for the word A, we see that it occurs in um, document T2, and in position two. And um, the word is, if we look at the word is, the third word here, um, it occurs in document O and in on two positions, position one and four, and it occurs in document one um, at position well, one. So this is basically the idea of the inverted index. So um, you need the postings for efficient term queries and you need, need the position information, the token position information for near queries, all near stuff, like phrase queries, spend queries, and so on. And, well, um, so we have seen um, the inverted index stores terms or tokens. So a document, um, a document is a stream of character. So the first step um, you have to do when indexing a document is, you have to break this stream of characters into tokens. By um, The slide has been stolen from Eric Hatcher. It's quite old. So, um, <clears throat> and this process of 
well, which is called analysis or tokenization in, in Lucene. Um, well, it's, you have to break the stream of characters into tokens, and then most of the time you apply additional well, normalization steps, like uh, the simplest normalization is case normalization. Um, you map all letters to lowercase uh, very often. Then you can have stop words. That's shown in the picture because um, the, the, the text is the quick brown, and the word the disappears, it doesn't go into the index. So um, it's a stop word here. And then um, you can have uh, additional normalization steps or analysis steps. Like uh, Usually you, you have stemmers. Um, what we have instead of stemmers is lemmatizers and decomposers. You can have part of speech taggers, which give you well, part of speech of your words. And you can have information extraction, what is also covered here. So. Um, what is morphological analysis and uh, what is it compared to stemming? Um, a morphological analyzer does three things for you. First, it is a lemmatizer, so it maps um, inflected forms of the words to their base forms. Um, so in English, it's uh, going is mapped to go. Bought, maybe, is then mapped to buy and so on. So it's um, such a morphology may not be so important for English, but is it is important for most European languages which have much more inflections than English. For example, German or uh, languages like Hungarian or Finnish or even Russian uh, is, is much more inflections than German. So for these morphological rich languages, um, I will argue and I, I show that, that it's um, really important to have um, uh, uh, lemmatizers instead of algorithmic stemmers. Um, the second thing a morphological analyzer is, it's, uh, or our morphological analyzers do, they are also decomposers. So decomposer is, um, <laughs> um, the reason why you need this, especially for German or for Dutch or, or Germ um, also Swedish uh, and Danish is, um, German is a little bit like Chinese. So, um, <laughs> Uh, the Chinese don't, write, don't um, use white spaces. And the same is true sometimes in German. You can attach words, words uh, to each other without writing white spaces, and it's, it's still valid words. So uh, here I have some examples, like um, you have Kinderbuch. Kinderbuch, it means children's book, but it's one word, Kinderbuch. And um, you have uh, Versicherungsvertrag, it, it means insurance contract, but again, one word. And um, here you have Holztisch, it means wooden table, or glass tisch, it means tisch made of glass. So, um, well, um, if, you, if you might, um, if your search might be tisch, um, you probably also want to find, or may, may want to find also documents containing Holztisch. So, um, morphological analyzer for German, it sh should also decompose your words, yeah? And um, what it, the third thing it does, it gives you word categories. So it finds out um, going, that's a, uh, the base form is go, and it's a verb. And a bacteria, uh, it's a noun. So these, these kind of categories. And if we look at an algorithmic stemmer, it, um, it may be good for English, but it, it maps going to go perfect, yeah, just by throwing away the suffix i and g. But what does it do with king if you don't have an exception list? So it, it may generate the word K, which is not uh, very helpful. And I got a uh, very um, uh, funny example. Um, if we go to the um, Lucid side, um, which uh, indexes all the user and, and uh, um, developer mailing list. And if, if I look for my um, colleague, uh, Bernhard Messer, who is also a Lucene committer, so his name is Messer. And I, if I do the search, um, I get a lot of documents. The first one is very good. But then I get documents um, with mess up. So it's clearly an example of overstemming. Yeah? Um, so um, my, my argument here is that um, for what can we, for, for what do we need such morphological analysis? Um, I argue that um, 
with a morphological analyzer, with both stemming and morphological analyzer, you get higher recall, that's clear. Yeah? Um, but with the morphological analyzer, you still have very good precision, which um, you not necessarily have with an algorithmic stemmer. And still so precision it might not be perfect, but it's much better than with an algorithmic stemmer. I will show you some examples from an, um, one of our customers. It's a um, very big German newspaper. It's the German Times. It's called Zeit. They have a solar installation for searching the whole archive, and they are using our morphological analyzers there. And for example, if I look for the word messen, messen, I type it, it means to measure. It's a, ver it's a verb. Yeah? So, what happens? Okay. I get um, 24,000 uh, hits. And it's interesting to look into these hits um, because many of these hits are really um, compound uh, words where we, and the, the document, documents match uh, because we have hits in compound words. So here, Messwerte, it's, um, well, values, uh, measuring values, something like that. And Gemessen, it's just an inflected form of this verb. And if we, we now compare this to a slightly different query, just a moment. This now messe, slightly different query, it means um, it's not the verb messen anymore, it means um, exhibition, it's a noun. And um, we get now 90,000 hits, completely different number. And the reason for that is that even uh, if this verb um, messen, to measure, has very many forms in, co uh, in common or ambiguous forms, which could also mean uh, messen exhibition, um, our linguistic is capable of distinguishing most of these cases while indexing. And um, if you type in the query, the mode currently is that it, if it uh, recognizes this uh, input, this query input is ambiguous, it decides to go for the search um, for the, the, the word that um, well, has this, the, the right base form. So if, if we look at the first hit, for example, it, uh, it highlights Messegelände, and this means area for exhibition. So it's, um, it's the other word, it's the noun here. And um, well, I, the third example I want to show you is how to um, use this decomposition stuff. I'm searching for Versicherungsvertrag, which means insurance contract. And I get some, um, well, some inflected forms of this um, insurance contract. And I even get this document, which doesn't contain explicitly um, the compound word Versicherungsvertrag, but which uh, contains um, Versicherung and Vertrag, this means insurance and contract, very close to each other, but not written as a compound word. So um, you see it here above. Here it contains Versicherung and then einen, one word in between, and then uh, Vertrag, contract. So this is just one example how you could use our morphology um, during search. Um, so we even tried to, in a, in a um, master thesis, a student tried to measure the differences uh, in recall and precision between uh, a algorithmic stemmer and our morphological approach. And what we see here, um, they, they, t they built a test corpus of uh, queries and perfect answer sets um, on a news corpus for German. 
And um, we had 40 nouns for testing, 30 verbs for testing. And what you see here is um, both a stemming and lemma um, tizer um, leads to a higher recall. That's here. And but of course, um, you have to pay for that with a little bit of precision, but you have to pay more on the precision side with the stemmer than uh, with the lemma morphological approach. And um, the same is true for the verb case. And I have to emphasize here that this is without the decom word decomposition. So if we switch on the decomposition, um, you would still um, have a much better um, recall um, because um, the, the ergonomic stemmer has almost no chance to, to cover these de decomposition, decomposition stuff. Yeah. Um, another usage um, of morphology is that if you normalize your words, you improve all you improve um, all your subsequent statistical methods like text classification or clustering, um, since they work on a much smaller uh, word basis than if you work with the statistical methods on your inflected forms. And um, if you have a clustering, for example, or if you have something like a semantic or associative search. Um, with your base forms, you are able to show base forms. And to, um, if you want to show phrases um, there, you can really have, since you have the categories, you can decide which is a noun phrase and which is not. And you, you're not, um, yeah, it, it's better than, than plain statistics. So I can show you some examples there. So this is um, on the German Wikipedia, and I've, if I search for um, Linux, um, I get here, it's something like clustering, um, I get strongly correlated words here. It's, I get Linux distribution, software, um, Linux kernel, I even get some phrases like SUSE Li Linux Enterprise, and just one of our features of the search engine. Um, if I look for the, if my query is something like house. So I get these um, strongly correlated words. Um, it's like Gebäude means building, for example. Um, so what I want to emphasize here, if you have a morphology, you can select base forms here. You can do the statistics on the base forms and you can show the base forms. And you can use the category information for your phrases. If you don't have morphology, what I'm going to show you now, I'm do th doing a search on the same index without morphology. And if I look at the words I get here, so the first thing is I get house. It means it was my query. But also a second word, I get an inflected form of house, houses. So um, that's not very nice. And I get strange phrases like war eine Familie, was a family, because uh, well, it's plain statistics, no category information. It's not a noun phrase, which I probably would like to see here. So morphology helps you for these statistical methods. And even for if you have clustering for the cluster labels, for deciding what, a what is a good cluster label. And um, the last point, why morphology might be useful, if you have some uh, ontologies or um, thesaurus, uh, or if you do cross-lingual search, you have to do lookup in uh, some lexicons. And the lexicons don't contain uh, full forms. They, they contain base forms. So before doing the lookup, you have to normalize your input to base forms. So you need morphology again. So, so much about the advantages. Um, how is it implemented? So we have, um, it's really handcrafted. So for example, for German, we have um, about 100,000 base forms and the mappings to all the inflection, in, inflected forms. And we store this in, well, it's not finite state, it's uh, basic, it's, uh, it's more letter tree. It's, it's wrong here. I've written finite state, but it's a letter tree. So it's always, but it fits into memory. It's not uh, very big and well, 
at least the, the short words, the lemmata, are stored in this, uh, in this map. And for the decomposition, um, we have an algorithm which, well, simply if it doesn't find a word completely in this letter tree, it starts from behind, from the back of the word, and tries to find the longest match. But this algorithm, uh, the simple algorithm, is not enough because um, if you look into details, you get a lot of wrong decompositions in this way. So you need filtering, uh, heavy filtering and fine detailed categories to... Okay. Thank you. Um, Polish, Serbo Croatian, and Greek. That's the languages we cover currently. Um, so, how do we use these results of the morphology in the index? Basically, we store full forms, base forms, and compound parts. Why do we do this? Because wildcard and fuzzy queries should go to full forms. As, all, as we all are used to. And um, the second reason is that um, we don't always want this um, well, morphological normalizers. We want to offer the user different search modes, like exact search going to the full forms, base form search going to the base forms, and if the user likes also, uh, search in compound parts. And this all doesn't have to be a yes, no decision, you can also do um, distinguish um, the relevance of the individual parts, exact search, base form search, and compound search with boosting. Yeah? And we distinguish these different types of terms currently uh, in the index by using prefixes. Like I, I've given a, an example how the index looks like if we have the word Versicherungsverträge in the document, the first uh, token we generate or the first term we generate is um, full form Versicherungsverträge. And then on the same position, we write the base form Versicherungsvertrag and we add in the prefix, we know it's a noun. And then on the same position again, we write the two compound parts, Versicherung and Vertrag. That's how the index looks with these analyzers. Yeah. Um, second point. Um, named entity recognition, so the goal of named entity recognition is to recognize entities within the document, within your text. Entities like persons, together with their first name, second name, profession, title, stuff like that. Organizations, um, the subtypes, like financial organizations, um, political parties, stuff like that. We have locations, um, city, region, country, and so on. Currency, prices, and so on. Um, we also recognize addresses, so a complete address including zip code, street, street number, city, phone, and so on. And we do a lot of customer specific stuff like raw materials, products, uh, GIS coordinates, skills for human resources, analyzing CVs automatically. And so what are, are the applications of these named entity stuff in search? Well, it's meta information, so um, the first thing is facets. I can show this. So we search for Lucene on the German Wikipedia, and now we look at the facets. That's how, that's how we show facets in our GUI. Um, and we want to see which are the persons most um, frequently um, mentioned together with Lucene. And what do we get? Let's see. So what we expect, so we first get duck cutting and we get a couple of other people which are mentioned in these 16 um, Wikipedia articles. Um, that contain uh, Lucene. We can also look at organizations. So, Oracle, I don't know why, Apache Software Foundation, not bad, I think. Um, 
hier Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar for Research. Why that? So I can use these facets, of course, to, to uh, specialize my search. One document remains, and if I click on this document, it seems that these, I, I looked at this before, it seems that these guys used Lucene somehow to, to um, present their data. They, um, make it available. they used Lucene to make available their data. And I can look what happens if we look for Linux. Oh, I have to remove the refinement. Which guys does our system find to give us Linux? Um, quite good. But a funny guy called Og Vorbis. So <laughs> it's not perfect. <laughs> Guy number two. So first application is, um, well, of course, facets. Um, one, one thing you can do with that is what I did now is search for experts. You have some documents from your company, you're looking for Lucene, and who are the guys in your company who know something about Lucene? That's the guys who show up in the facet, uh, in the person facet in this case. But you can do another very funny thing. Instead of adding the named entities that you detected into separate field for facets, you can add them um, into your content field, directly at the position where um, the names occurred. So this is how an index, uh, in this case, was look, would look like. If I identify a guy called Peter Müller in my text, I would, in my token stream, while indexing, I would add at this position um, the token Peter Müller, maybe um, a separate token Peter, a separate token Müller, and a very gen generic token person name. This simply says, at this position in my document, there's a person occurring. And why would I like to do the, something like that? Um, well, first, these, uh, these Peter Müller and Peter Müller tokens allow me a new kind of query. I can now have a query like, I'm looking for the word brown, but it has to be part of a person name. I don't want to find the color brown, I only want to find guys with the name brown. That's one idea. And um, the other thing is, if I have such generic tokens like person name or date or so, and I know at this position in my document, there's a person occurring, there's an organization occurring. This allows me queries of the type, um, give me, um, well, give me um, documents that contain Microsoft and found it, and synonyms of founding, and a person name nearby. And um, these documents probably contain um, the, the name Bill Gates. And based on these kind of new queries, we have built a question answering system, which I'm going to show you. Okay. This is not too bad. No. Okay. So this system, it's again for German, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Um, here, you can uh, type in um, a natural language query. Like this query is, wer erfand die Dampfmaschine? It means, who invented the steam engine? And it's not really that the system understands the query, but what it understands is that um, in this um, query, I want, I'm searching for a person or an organization. That's identified by, by the, the question word where. And um, this organization or person should be very close to steam engine and words like affinden or invention. Yeah? And that's exactly what I'm getting here. So um, the steam engine, which is highlighted, and the system also highlights Thomas Newcomen. It, um, 
you, know, you may notice there's no Thomas Newcomen in the query. It's just um, it found this document because it contains a person very close to Steam Engine and uh, maybe to Affinten, and it highlights the person here. So this may be an answer to the question. And I can, um, well, place uh, other questions like, um, when did the Second World War start? And I really get interesting answers. So it highlights the year 1936, so or 1937. And actually, the Second World War didn't start in Europe. It started a little bit earlier in Asia. Um, was started by Japan. So it's these kind of, of, of queries that you can um, do with uh, based on the main entity recognition. So. Um, I have some more slides which we could step, skip, um, but if, uh, if there's still time, I can sh tell you a little bit about how we implemented the named entity recognition. So the technology is um, we're using gazetteers, that's big lexicons of first names and second names, for example, of places, locations all over the world. We are using, the system is not based plainly on, on gazetteers. It additionally uses local grammars, so it's rule-based. It de describes a little bit the, the context of these entities, which is a good context and which is a bad context. So based on these, these grammars and these context descriptions, it, um, it can even identify names, um, person names, if the individual parts of the names are not in the gazetteers. So it can guess somehow. And for the date stuff, for uh, telephone numbers, email expressions, of course, we're using regular expressions. Um, all of this is built on gate. It's, uh, from, it's open source. From the, the, the framework is open source, not our named entity stuff. Um, the framework is gate from the University of Sheffield. But we have thrown out almost all the components because they were instable. So currently, we're using the graphical user interface for the development, which is quite nice. And we're using the JPEG grammars. We have our own gazetteer component and tokenizer components. Yeah. And um, below, you see an example how such a context rule could look like. This is um, not just a rule for an entity uh, recognition. It recognizes relations. So it says here, relation between companies, like company acquisitions, typical stuff. Like um, you have um, an organization should build may um, merge with another organization. So this is how you describe such sentence patterns with local grammars, just to give you an impression. This is how the graphical user interface uh, from Gate looks like. It's very fine for testing. So you see here with the different colors, um, which persons have been identified. So this is a date, this is a location, blue are locations here, green seem to be persons. So um, this is um, a demonstration of the automatic component. So um, you very often have the situation that you recognize a person name or an organization in a document. Um, in one place you have the complete name, but in other places like Aaron, Ariel Sharon, but in other places you only have the second name. So this somehow normalizes and merges these two different occurrences. And we do normalization, like in the simplest case for dates, like if we have um, 24th uh, till 26th of April, um, what ends up uh, in our index is um, a normalized form, like um, instead of April we have um, months four, stuff like that. Um, we do aggregation, especially in person names or in addresses. Um, so an address is a very complex entity consisting of an organization here or a person of a, uh, of a city, a zip code, street, telephone number, and so on. So that's it. Very intensive. 
Yes. <laughs> That's one of, um, and Did also the more, yeah, um, sorry. Um, the question was how labor intensive was um, the writing the rules for the named entity recognition. And we are writing these, these rules and also uh, concerning the, our morphology. This is handcrafted, so it's not, and you need computer linguists for that. For that. And it's very labor intensive, and, and that's one of the reasons why we, um, why it's not open source, I think. Um, it was an, quite an investment, and um, well, we decided not to, to make it open source. Um, well, uh, concerning the morphology, I can't even tell. We started with that uh, 10 years ago. So it was, uh, it, well, we didn't start from scratch. We even had some resources at that time. And concerning the named entity recognition, um, it was now, I would say, three years of work. Concerning the German named entity recognition, our English named entity recognition has not quite the quality level like the German, but it's improving. And, yeah. Um, we are using supervised machine learning for text classification. Uh, sorry, the question was whether we are using. Uh, yeah. The question was whether we use supervised learning for entity recognition? Yeah. Yeah. We're not using, it's completely rule based. Okay. So um, the advantage is. Um, that you can um, faster adapt to, to customer data. Because named entity recognition is very, um, it, in many cases it has to, has to be uh, adopted to the document type. If you have a good named entity recognition component for um, newspaper texts, and then um, you get a customer who wants you to analyze CVs, completely different contexts for, for names, for example. If you have CVs from a human resource company, yeah. So, um, and um, with the statistical approaches, you need a lot of training material. While if you have a computer linguist, um, he knows more about the language, so it's it's faster to to develop. Do you, do you use any user feedback to improve your? Uh, <coughs> yes. Uh, the question was: Do you do we use any user feedback to improve our? Um, but, um, the quality of the of the recognition. Um, we use um, we we do use user feedback or customer feedback. So we get about the morphology. We we get back uh, get feedback from our customers, and um, even for the German version, which is quite um, well, stable and, and very high quality. So even Langenscheid using our morphology in their electronic uh, lexica, for example. But we get uh, feedback. We collect it over the year, and we we do a new at least one new release per year. And um, concerning the named entities, if you have the named entities in, in the facets, you, you see at least um, the false positive. You find them very fast, and the customers find them very, very fast. Um, okay. um, you mentioned uh, part of speech tagging and uh, morphologies. Um, do you actually use them, or are those uh, just uh, uh, stuff you could implement afterwards? The <laughs> um, question is whether we use part of speech tagging or ontologies. Um, well, our morphology already uh, delivers word categories, and we have a little bit of disambiguation if words are ambiguous. But, um, well, so it's already kind of part of, kind of, sort of, part of speech tagging. Um, concerning ontologies, we're using Tesauri. Um, we're using, uh, in some of our text classification projects, uh, funny, uh, we're using, for example, mesh uh, tissues. So we're using um, ontologies more on the, more on the, uh, on the projects where we do, for example, also for Zeit, where we do tagging, automatic tagging of documents. Or we, we can use it in, in, um, in the facet stuff. Yeah. But not, we are not building ontologies ourselves and not using them for the named entity recognition. Okay. 